you know, a person <laughs> in a couple of days could make a feature film. And then have like Charlie, you be some AI character for just, you know, a few seconds. How many steps did you take to make it overall? My love, why dost thou seem so cross today? Thy words dost cause me pain and plight. To make a AI generated video out of this, you're going to use our voices, but it's going to generate the characters and the settings. Yes, it's going to generate the characters and the settings, but I plan to use voice our voices to, you know, kind of overlay it maybe side by side. And Famous Picasso quote, which said, computers are useless, they only give you answers. But now, yeah. the most important thing about the computer becomes the question. Uh, I mean, metaverse is really, it's a made up word from yeah. science fiction, but it's a good way of talking about where are we going with all of this. You know, interestingly, I, I take the, one of the things that I love about digital worlds is being not myself, right? So we're going to have a conversation about how you made it. And that's going to be the content of the yeah. video that the AI is going to make. That's right. And then what we're probably going to do is take, you know, this conversation we have and then have like Charlie, you be some AI character for just, you know, a few seconds and then maybe flip to another AI character. Um, that's, this is actually my first time doing this. So I guess we'll find out live. I'm game. I'm, I'm totally intrigued. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it looks. So good way to start out. I saw the video that you posted. It sounded like it was a Shakespeare scene being avateered by remote actors, you know, just, just operating avatars. So I was shocked when you described the process of uh, constructing the scene in two hours using different AI programs. So I know you posted it, but for the sake of this conversation, can you just explain it, sort of walk through it, the three steps you took? Yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. So um, basically, uh, and, and it actually took probably a little less than two hours. So it's it was, you know, a lot of it was just setup work. So um, so you could, you could imagine, you, you know, a person <laughs> in a couple of days could make a feature film. Yeah, well, there, there are definitely limitations. There are definitely limitations to technology. So we're actually looking at how far we can take it. And actually, that's kind of the next step that, you know, I'm looking into is how could you make, you know, more of the scene, right? Because uh, you, you see that it's a two shot or it's not a two shot. It's, you know, the one shot of each person, but you go kind of back and forth. It's a dialogue. But it was, it's 2D yeah. media. That's right. That's right. So, you know, we can't get like, you know, close up of the hands and stuff like that. But the, the way effectively is um the way to describe it is we created you know so and i guess I, I could say the word i since it was just a few minutes for me on my phone most of the time so went to chat gpt <laughs> which i've been playing around with um but you, you know, joined it you're a member of chat gpt uh yeah yeah and i think uh, <laughs> a lot of developers are you know a lot of people developers and people are creating stories uh, are definitely um you know playing around with it i mean it's a free tool right so anyone, right. anyone you know, in the world can, can join, you know, they have to just, you know, complete a questionnaire and say they're a developer, which, you know, as long as you are, then, you know, they'll, they'll give you access. So I went oh, in I and see. just put in some, you know, I put in some, uh, prompts. So you have access to chat GPT in a way that I don't paying them $20 a month. Uh, no, I don't pay any money. No, it's, I pay right. $0 a month. So right. I'm saying you get yeah. a different version of it than I get as a member no. of the public. No, I, I, I'm just a member of the I guess member of the public. Uh, the reason I bring up the developer thing is when you sign up, it doesn't give you access unless you click the box. Oh, I'm using it for development purposes or something. Oh, like I see. I yeah. See. So I know I have no, uh, all the things that I'm, all the tools that were used to make that video, um, all of those are available for free to the entire world today. Right. So anybody around the world with an internet connection, whether you're in America or you're in, you know, Zambia or, you know, you're in Thailand, you can, you can do that for free, right. As long as you have an internet connection. So, um, yeah. So basically went to chat GPT, put in a few prompts to generate a script, right. You know, obviously the, the prompts themselves become very important because one of the things I, I asked for was, you know, I tried different versions of a scene of, you know, a man and a woman breaking up. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, having put in it in iambic pentameter, uh, you know, I mean, it generated what I think is not great iambic pentameter in terms of, you know, the actual words, but it, it was, it was pretty cool to see the, um, you know, to see an output. I was completely fooled. I thought it was a scene from some Shakespeare play. <laughs> no, it's, it's entirely the entire thing. Um, other than the editing. I mean, obviously yeah, that was the reference that yeah. the AI got. Definitely. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I mean, there are other people in the world who created iambic pentameter stuff, but 
you know, I think, uh, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, Shakespeare is obviously the most well-known, uh, around the world. So, um, so yeah, so, so effectively what, um, did was create that, create that script to then generate art through, you know, something called mid journey, which just, you know, you put, you put in prompts to generate art and it didn't quite generate. I mean, for me, I, I just put in, I wanted, uh, the orc, right. Sitting in an American diner, which I think I got, I wanted a Tolkien esque or orc. Uh, and then I also wanted a Tolkien esque elf sitting in the diner and it didn't really give me the elf. I mean, I guess maybe you can kind of see it in her ears, but it's basically an elf and an orc, but I don't think the elf part really, uh, conveys. No, I got that. It was kind of a role-playing game scene, uh, if you will. Uh, I mean, here's the thing about this. And I said it the minute I saw chat GPT, all of a sudden asking questions is an art form. It's funny. You remember there's a famous Picasso quote, which said computers are useless. They only give you answers. But now, <laughs> but now yeah. the most important thing about the computer becomes the question. Right. And so there, and there is an art to that, right? Because you were making all those you know, association, free associations and making a creative request. So there definitely was an art to how you uh, constructed the scene. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I I don't know how much credit I can take given that, you know, AI, I feel like did almost everything, but that that is actually now the really- Oh, no, you told it what to do. I mean, you made assumptions and hoped- uh, that it would start to construct your scene. But look, I mean, you're an artist, so you would have repeated it and repeated it if you thought it was promising yeah. to get the result that you wanted. I mean, crazy that you got it at the first swing yeah. and didn't have to revise the question a few times to uh, yeah. get the result you wanted. That part is amazing. Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's interesting. I'm not. I a lot of these tools I used for the very first time. So um, you know, I'd heard about the tools, and of course, AI is something that's been on our radar for years now. But I think I think it's really become just uh, uh, just very apparent how useful it is. And in many ways, it's like you know I've directed, I've been lucky to direct you know films in in XR and, and you know VR specifically. And what we did here is not too unlike you know what it was. It's like working with a production team in some ways. Now now there's a lot of like things that are, but it's like you know working with the art department, which is an AI, working with you know story, which is you know an AI. Now, working with humans is, of course, far vastly more rewarding, <laughs> but the actual process of the work wasn't too different, which I found interesting, right, in its own way. So I, I you know, it lacked nuance. Oh, totally. Right. It lacked like if it went through the hands of an animator, obviously there'd be lots of nuance. And as you said, you know, as a director, of course, you know, you have to hate the fact that in VR, you're not in control of time. Right. There's no cuts. <laughs> there's no close ups. Uh, you know, there's no uh, panning shots. You know, all of that is in the hands of the viewer. So, um, you know, it sort of feels like with this, you know, you're making a 2D scene and, you know, kind of not having to go through the pain of being a live action director. But but again, the nuance has I mean, I wonder if it could be, you know, if it was, you know, not Shakespeare, if it was a little less stilted, you know, a little more like delivered by a real actor, you know, because it didn't quite have that, you know, it was still slightly like replicant, <laughs> you know, like, eh, you know, we should do a turning test on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think these AI tools, at least from what I can see are going to be replacing, like, I don't think anyone's going to be, you know, fearing, you know, running for their, you know, running for their jobs in any real way. Um, and when it comes to creative, but what I think it shows is a glimmer that, you know, these things are advancing so quickly that, it, you know, soon it's going to be able to do a lot. Like, I think right now, a very strong use case is just in pre-production, right? So let's say you're a solo writer or a solo director trying to understand how your scene could look, right? And, you know, you don't have a lot of time or money to pay for, um, a lot of actors. Storyboards are expensive, as you know, and and you know, there's an art to making them too. You know, at Pixar, they're they're just some most incredible storyboard artists I've you know I've ever seen. You know, this process where a ca characters molded 
by a lot of different hands. And that's what makes makes the performance so rich. You know, the actor contributes, the animator contributes, the director contributes, the screenwriter contributes. So the, you know, the actor as presented on, uh, you know, in the video at that point has really been crafted and recrafted and, you know, sort of, the, sort of an endless cascading game of can you top this? Exactly. Yeah, we used to call that at Disney the mallet squad where you had to perform the storyboard for all of your colleagues. So, you know, other artists, you know, as well as executives, maybe a director or a producer. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of pressure, you know, to both to top it, but also to do something that can't be topped. You know, where that leaves everybody with their mouths hanging open. <laughs> Very much agreed. But when, you're, when your colleagues come up with better ideas just sitting there uh, in front of everybody, that's where the mallet squad comes in. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, and, you know, like in the creation of all of our work to date, you know, it's been about that, right? You know, you kind of have this unbounded time where you sit in a room, you know, you crack open a, you know, a, a soda, you know, maybe, maybe a beer and just hang around for a long time, just discussing and thinking about how to make the story better. And I think that you know, it was an invaluable, obviously an invaluable, um, you know, way to create that's been true for, you know, for a long time. But for things like news, yeah, um, you know, it could be very effective, you know, especially because, you know, you want something that is timely. So uh, I think, you know, journalists are going to become fact gatherers for, for uh, AI. Yeah, that's right. Right. So a New York Times reporter job is to collect the original information and the AI does everything else. So that's going to screw up my profession pretty good. So there was, so those were two steps that you took. How many steps did you take to make it overall? My love, why dost thou seem so cross today? Thy words dost cause me pain and plight. I've thought on this a while and must convey our loves at end. Tis time to say good night. What say thou? Dost thou wish to part with me? Indeed, good sir, I do. My heart is free. I need a love that's real not just pretense, a love that grows and thrives with joy immense. But I dost love thee, heart and soul so true. What more dost thou require of me to do? Thy love dost mean the world, but tis not fair for thee to take for granted all I bear. I want a love that's strong, where I can thrive and grow and bloom to reach my highest drive. Then I shall change, and all thy dreams come true. I'll show thee love like none and make it new. Thy words dost sound so sweet, so kind, but actions speak so loud the change must find. Then I'll depart. So and script I'll made through ChatGPT, made the art through Midjourney, dialogue through Eleven, Eleven Labs, animated it through DID. So I'm sorry, DID? A DID is an app that if you put in a script or an audio, it'll animate a picture. So it'll take a character. So you fed the work character into it and it animated it. That's right. With the audio from the speech to text from Eleven Labs, so that so was so it let you input all those things, and then it came out with the with the uh, animated video. That's exactly right. Well, that is crazy. What voices did it use? I mean, were, are there did just synthesize the voices? Well, um, so DID has its own synthesized voices. So I made a previous video, you know, which you might be able to see. Uh, I posted it earlier in the day, and then after that. Um, I decided to use 11 labs, which I learned about later in the day through a Zoom call, right? So I'd made this video already, the one before <laughs> the one you saw. And the, the audio was much more stilted and much more replicant you like, right? So I ended up using 11 labs, which I just learned about, and it was much better audio. And there are actually people out there on Twitter who have done a much better job of actually taking a script and having it come alive. You know, it's not gonna replicate, you know, great actor, but what, what's kind of great is it's actually probably better than a bad actor, for example, right? Well, you could. Couldn't you have a great actor record it and just make that one of the things that you upload? That's exactly right. So you could do that as well. Then you're not going to get the performance from the actor, but you will get the, you know, the voice. You mean you can't create animation to go with the voice? Exactly. Can you yeah. instruct the AI to do that? I'm sure... I'm sure you could try. Right. Well, it's very immature technology, right? So, but now 
don't you think that like a Disney could go in there and say, well, let's take AI, let's make a license from chat GPT and figure out how to do that? You know, it's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, what, what's amazing about this combo is it feels like some of our earliest combos, Charlie, and that we're, we're kind of looking at this new tech. And I think everyone's trying to figure out what can we do with it, right? Yep. Well, I, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be something amazing, but I'm just trying to process it myself. And, and you know, I tell because perhaps because of my age, it takes me a while to process these things, uh, you know, sort of like crypto, uh, you know, I just never quite, you know, web three, I think I finally get what that is, but it took me a really long time to kind of fully absorb what people were talking about. And of course I had it, you know, my first reaction is always a natural aversion, although I don't have that feeling about uh, AI. I think partly because, you know, that was my field, primary field of expertise, whereas AI is not. I'm just a student. I mean, I'm certainly no expert in, in AI, but, you know, what's what is interesting when you look into it, there are a lot of things that it can't do. Right. So, for example, in the generation of images, you know, you have all this training data that it's using to generate an image of, you know, an elf in a diner. Um, but you can't, for example, you know, it's 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 hard to do things out of the training data, right? So if you don't have that, you know, the, the outputs are only as good as the data that's fed into it. And then the model that you create uh, to create, to, to sort of, um, you know, generate these new outputs. Um, so I think like if a Disney or just really any studio or even just us goes in and says like, okay, let's try to make a feature film with this, right? Like you can, I can whip together a scene in minutes that is what you saw, right? Literally minutes, right? It was certainly like way less than two hours, but Going beyond that, even just like getting a close up of the hand on the table, like that becomes difficult, right? Couldn't you, I mean, just backing up, couldn't you as a director say, hey, AI, take that scene and give me a close up of the hands and give me a close up of their face and give me an over the shoulder shot and give me a establishing shot? Doesn't he know what those things are? No, it doesn't. It that's that's the crazy thing. It doesn't. I told it to write a um, a story about VR in the style of Charlie Fink, a and it actually made a game try, but it was it was completely free of facts. So, nonetheless, VR will someday be important. <laughs> and it just filled the whole thing up with generalities. You know, I thought, wow, well, you'd have to be a pretty dumb professor to think this was written by a person. Although I have seen some things that I thought, oh, this could should be, it feels like it was written by an AI and it wasn't. So I think there are certain business schools and actually, you know, being gone to business school where some of these essays are being written by chat GPT and actually passing exams, at least <laughs> right. you know, I hear that. <laughs> And it's uh, well, it makes me question my choices. Also, as a college <laughs> professor, you don't read them that carefully. If there's a lot of them, I mean, I'm looking for a few things and a few ideas. I don't actually assign papers anymore. They do plenty of writing on the quizzes and the tests. Uh, and and the, the paper would be torturing them and torturing me. A dual torture. Who's more tortured in that scenario? Exactly. Well, I mean, the truth is that's not the way people communicate today. You know, they communicate with images and videos and, you know, uh, so that's the skill that they need to hone much more than narrative writing, which, as we just discussed, is, you know, likely to be, uh, you know, changed, if not completely transformed. I mean, this is potentially an Internet size disruption. I I, I think so. And, um, you know, I, I think the time scale is is the question. Well, clearly, clearly there have to be ways for individual users to upload content, right? There has to be a way of you taking that scene or not completely other scene. And let's take a live action scene and you only shot the establishing shot. There should be a way to put the characters in there and put the establishing shot in there and even the drawings of the set and have it construct a more a high fidelity version and one that gives you back the control of time. You know, we're, we're looking into that. It's certainly not possible today for a variety of reasons, but, um, right. you know, uh, there should be a way. I think you're right. Well, I mean, just it, it would be the next step of usefulness because right now the usefulness is very general and people sort of are just discovering as you are. Well, what does that mean? 
So I think you've got a long way on on a lot of new technology. Sounds like sort of just as an by accident, you had no idea how it was going to turn out. I, I didn't know how it was going to turn out, but I mean, I, I had a clue that you know that it was going to be interesting, right? Like, I mean, I kind of knew it would be interesting. So interesting. I was kind of running between stuff, and uh, yeah, I just started on my phone. Even like, I wasn't even at a computer when I started making that scene, right? So a lot of that scene was just me on Chat GPT on my iPhone, and a lot of the steps were actually just done on my iPhone, and I kind of finished it up on a computer. But that wasn't almost not even necessary, right? A lot of these tools are just available for for anybody to make a. AI generated video out of this, you're going to use our voices, but it's going to generate the characters and the settings. That's right. Yeah. That, well, yes, it's going to generate the characters and the settings, but I plan to use voice, our voices to, you know, kind of overlay it maybe side by side and just see what the, you know, see what it's like. It would be, unfortunately, I don't think you're going to be able to do it, but it's sort of like, Ooh, could I match the character, the design of the character to the voice? Yeah, I think that might be tough. But I mean, is there a character that you would like to? Well, is there a character you'd like to be? I, I'm curious if if that's so, then I can try to <laughs> design one for you. And uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. well, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of nutty professor character probably would be <laughs> okay. All right, I'll I'll do an input of nutty professor and or, see or yeah. nutty professor wearing a VR headset. <laughs> nutty professor wearing a VR headset. Okay, okay, and a tweed suit. And a tweed. Hold on a second. Okay, this is this is quite a lot. So uh, and a tweed a suit with a bow tie. <laughs> okay. So you want to be a nutty professor uh, in a tweed it's, suit wearing a bow tie, right? Um, and anything else with a, wearing a VR? Well, headset? bald, bald with a gray goatee. Uh, bald with a gray goatee. Okay. Between between fifty and sixty years old. Between fifty to sixty years old. Uh, any art styles you want, like um, you can pick any artist, like Picasso to you know Rembrandt to you know a modern artist, for example. Uh, Grant yeah. Wood. I don't know why a 1930s thing came to me, but hey, there you, are. you know uh, Emerson said the sort of the first instincts always best, right? It's sort of you know what it comes from because you know I take my students into all these different social VR experiences, and we go as a group. Everybody creates their own avatar. <laughs> One student said to me, Professor, you create the same avatar in every virtual world. And that is this this one that you just because you create I mean the first thing everybody creates is something that looks like them. And then as they become more, I mean, they want the idealized version of them. So thin Charlie, not fat Charlie. Huh. You know, I you know interestingly, I, I take the one of the things that I love about digital worlds is being not myself, right? So but you're, but I mean, you're a very sophisticated user. I'm saying the first thing that everybody does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's see. I like the one on the, yeah. Any of those kind of works, although yeah, yeah but I mean, any of those, any of those. <laughs> okay. I like the one on the lower, right. That'll work <laughs> lower, right. Okay. So I can make, what I can do is I can make variations now of the one on the lower, right. So I'm going to go ahead yeah, and do I that. mean, the one on the lower left is good. Also, that one's a little older looking, I think. So do you want to do lower left, lower right? And then I can also ask. No, I mean, I like, I, honestly, I like the one on the lower right because you got yeah. the VR headset, but also the glasses and you can see the eyes. Got it. Is there any changes you'd like me to ask for in the variations of it? Any, um, any things that are different? Like, uh, you know, no, it's fine. Uh, it's fine. I mean, the, yeah. the, there could be more definition around the VR headset so we could tell what it is. Okay. Maybe um, with a, uh, with a, meta quest pro vr headset yeah all right let's try that i don't know if it can do a meta quest pro at all i'll ask because that looks more like a maybe it'll just give you a different kind of vr headset the one mm -hmm. above it looks like it's using the magic leap one it does yeah it does and then you've got yeah it's kind of interesting what they i don't know what the one in the upper left is that one doesn't make any sense yeah that yeah maybe apple will put out a headset like that right i'm joking yeah i mean <laughs> I'm who knows yeah but there we go. I mean, I, mean, I, was, I think that Apple is putting out some kind of a, a pass through, not a see through. Yeah. Well, you know, the MetaQuest Pro, uh, I mean, going to XR now rather than AI, the MetaQuest Pro, what I, what I kind of love about, um, you know, uh, what, what I love about it is uh, I was traveling in, you know, in, in Europe and, I, you know, I had a small little laptop and I was using the MetaQuest Pro as like, you know, a screen. And I was like, this is actually a really useful. You know, like VR can be fun, but it's not really useful, right? 
Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think it actually uh, is a lot more useful uh, than it is succeeding as a game platform. Huh, that's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, you know, people are, people are doing exercises and using it for, you know, networking and, you know, social VR. I mean, those things are free and, and they are the things that people are doing. I mean, when they announced, they announced that after two years, they had sold a billion and a half dollars worth of software and they were very, very, very excited and pleased with themselves. And then uh, it turns out that, um, Call of Duty goes on sale and makes that much money in two weekends. So it sort of puts in perspective, you know, it's, I mean, it's a niche game console like the Switch. I mean, that's where we are right now. I think the the problem is people still prefer other screens to do most things. I mean, people are doing Supernatural, which, I mean, I never would have predicted that. And I mean, I, I, I would find it, I would find it terribly upsetting to be doing a lot of exercise while wearing a quest. <laughs> That's been a killer use case in during COVID for, for yeah. us, by the way. Yeah. So like my, my wife and I, um, you know, like she- Oh, you guys do the supernatural thing on the quest? No, we don't even do supernatural. We do uh, Beat Saber. So oh. I, we did sign up for supernatural. I think it's a cool app and it's, you know, you know, all power to, you know, to, to um, Chris, Milk, you know, Chris yeah. Aaron and, the, and their team. Um, but like, I just like Beat Saber itself, just, you know, like prefer it. So it wasn't even a matter of the subscription though. That was kind of, you know, a thing it's like getting, you know, having to pay the subscription price for Supernatural, but all the way back in quaint old 2020, you know, like, you know, we live in Park City, Utah, they shut down the ski slopes because of COVID and my wife and I are like, well, how are we going to work out? Right. Do we got to get a Peloton or whatever? And it's like, oh, I got to get this like big bike. And I just picked up the VR headsets that we have lying around. And she just started using it so much that I had to get her her own quest too, because like, you know, we're sweating in this thing, right? Playing Beat Saber on Expert <laughs> Plus or whatever, right? And she got really good. I mean, she went from nothing to being you know, Expert <laughs> Plus in Beat Saber. And you got to work out at the same time. So she could work out, right? During COVID. Yeah. Like, like, so, yeah. So, I mean, you know, they describe the metaverse in different ways. That there's consumer metaverse, like gaming, et cetera. There's like the enterprise metaverse. There's the industrial metaverse, which is like, you know, using it in oil rigs or whatever. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the consumer metaverse I've used all the time still, you know, like my wife is a musician. So she did, you know, like a live show and, mm -hmm. you know, in VR actually just the other day. Right. So it's kind of cool that that's yep. possible and can be done. Um, but uh, yeah, like, like I, I, I think the social part is cool. I guess, my point about the whole using it as a screen was I didn't use it in the enterprise metaverse context much. I guess if I define enterprise metaverse as like, you know, like using it, you know, to like conduct meetings on Zoom or in VR, right? I mean, like, with regard to meetings, I mean, it's more of a novelty. A lot of things you can't do in it, but you definitely feel present with the other people in a way that you don't on Zoom because you're having an actual experience, not a media experience. Totally. And this is the, it's worse than a media experience because it's a media experience on your PC <laughs> where you've got a lot of other things going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it's good perspective. It's good perspective, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, did you see that movie? It was like a Sundance movie like a year ago. It was called We Met in Vir Virtual Reality. Yeah. It was uh, Joe yeah. Hunting's movie. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, Joe, but you know, I saw that and uh you know, I, I wish it had more of an impact. Like, it seems like it's had an impact, but not not as much. I it's, think. I mean, it's got yeah. a couple of problems. One is it's kind of depressing, and the other is kind of. And you know, this is the problem with VR. It's damned with faint praise. Oh, isn't this great? There's a VR movie, and it's really boring. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad movie, but it's a slow moving documentary. You know, and they but they you know the narrative method is sort of peeling back appearances but when you peel back the experiences the regular people are not that interesting <laughs> that's interesting you, you know and some of them yeah. are kind of sorry ass people you know i mean that's always been one of the secrets of social vr is that the people who are there the most are, are people who have to be there yeah, yeah you know who don't have other alternatives for yeah you know, getting out they don't like the mm -hmm. way they look they have a physical handicap yeah anyway i thought it was great that it got selected and it got attention nothing but good for vr yeah uh, but i don't know ultimately how many people are going to see that movie and say i want to be in vr yeah 
I, you know, your commentary about, you know, the outcasts, um, being the ones in social VR is I think accurate. Um, but isn't that kind of how the internet started, right? Like yes. in the nineties, right? Like the Absolutely. people in ICQ chat rooms. One hundred percent. And it's like, who would ever do this? And then like, of course now everybody's, I mean, we're on the internet. Who's not on the internet now? Right. right? So right. I really feel like it's that there. And you know, it's really unfortunate that that's true about, you know, social, I think it's really unfortunate that that's true about social VR, right? Like, I mean, I, I feel like well-adjusted people could enjoy it just as much as anyone else. Well, but I went to plenty of chance. plenty of industry events in alt space VR, and they really work bad. You know, you talk to people who are proximate to you. You looked around not for somebody you recognize, but for a name that you recognize. Uh, I mean, it felt very much. You know, you felt very present in a social guest, social in a real social context, and you know, much superior to Zoom that you couldn't have in Zoom. You know, you couldn't have in any other media. Now, uh, there there are certainly places on VR chat that are good for that also. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, all the alt space users are getting pushed to VR chat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the VR chat hosting bill must be enormous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, VCs are just paying for it. Yeah. You know, I think what we're seeing is free is not free forever. Free yeah. is like free at the beginning. It's sort of like Uber, right? They underwrote the cost of Uber rides for five years and they groomed us to the economy and the ease of ride sharing. And then having killed all the cab companies and turned all the cab drivers into Uber drivers, they stopped subsidizing the rides and the price went up 60%. And they had to pay the drivers real money so, you know, it went up another 30%. So now it's basically double the price of what it used to be. So it's like, we're going to revolutionize this industry, take out the middle band, and then raise the prices. And that's exactly what they've done, right? Because You sound better, Charlie. Uh, well, I'm just saying this is what disruption is. You know, usually it doesn't result in any real savings for consumers. Uh, and usually something that is free or seems too good to be true, is actually too good to be true. What is new is the venture strategy of underwriting the product to keep the cost artificially low. That's a strategy we used to see in the game console business or in the handset business in, uh, you know, the wireless business. You know, subsidize the handset because you're selling the bandwidth. Yeah, or the drug business, right? Exactly. Exactly. But in this case, you know, they disrupted real businesses and, and real lives. And uh, I think for a lot of people, it was very difficult. Well, and they also made a, well, they made a lot of money on it, too, right? I mean, I, I speak to this as a former venture capitalist. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think it was a great deal for the venture capitalist and not such a great deal for somebody at the San Jose airport that needs to go five miles. Also, no, none of the convenience of just walking up to a cab and getting in. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know... I mean, maybe as somebody who's in San Francisco for a long time, I mean, you know, now I'm in Park City, Utah, where it's a very different game, but in San Francisco, you couldn't get a cab for, right? like, you just couldn't get a cab, right? So, like, I used to live in New York and San Francisco, and the interesting thing about Uber is, I mean, there's a reason Uber, you know, was built and grown in San Francisco, because if Uber didn't exist, like, I would still not be able to get a cab in San Francisco. Right, right. <laughs> right, because so, right, the cab service sense, was so bad there. Yeah, I get I it. I mean, I really think it depends on geography. San Francisco yes. is not the entire United States, obviously. But I can no, say no, I think, I think Francisco, you're making a good is, point. I think you're value. making a good point. There were places that needed the additional service that they provide. So and it isn't yeah. universally true. I think it's just true of cities, mainly. And, and mostly medium-sized cities. So I'll tell you a story, Orlando Airport. I'm in a hotel downtown. Uh, I was speaking at a conference. I needed to get to the Orlando Airport. And uh, it was 5 p.m. and I could not get an Uber. And there was no alternative. The only other alternative was to get a black car or a limo for $400 an hour. So eventually I got a black car, an Uber that was $200. I was like, okay, well, this is the only way to get eight miles to the airport. So I ended up paying $200 to go eight miles and I had no other alternative. 
Well, I mean, at least you had the opportunity to spend the two. Like, imagine you didn't have that service at all, right? And then you would, I mean, what would right. you do? Well, like, but or... but but we're talking <laughs> about Orlando. Life. Yeah. So Orlando should have a large cab ecosystem. People are going from hotels to Disneyland. It's It's got to have a big, you know, uh, taxi ecosystem, which it doesn't exist anymore. So all they've got is Uber. So anyway, well, setting that aside, I mean, you know, they got really rich and they got rid of the cab businesses. And now they can charge whatever they want. That basically is the bottom line. So and Uber is a public company. They need to squeeze every ounce of margin out of that business. Yeah, there's a, there's a theory about that. And in, in, um, we learned in business school, you know, the, the idea that private companies can, you know, plan for the long run in a way that obviously public companies that need to make quarterly earnings can't. So unless they're owned by an individual like Mark Zuckerberg, who can't <laughs> put it out, and pretty much it's his toy. Yeah, well, you could argue that that his control of the company is allowing them to, for better or worse, you know, plow the money into. Absolutely. You Listen, know, Mark. Into XR. If and if it we weren't for Mark Zuckerberg, if it yeah. weren't for Mark Zuckerberg buying Oculus, yeah, you and I would not be having this conversation today. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably still be at Oculus, actually, right? Because uh, you know, when no, I joined Oculus, Oculus, no, I promise you, Oculus would have been out of business. I mean, there's no way Oculus could have raised enough money. The rift sucked; it didn't sell. They buried thousands of units. Mm. No, it would not have worked. They would have been out of business. When I joined, I actually did the thing where I made a model because like um, when I was a VC, we would the joke, which wasn't a joke because it was true, is that the average investment lasts longer than the average American marriage. So our, our average investment would last eight years. Right. So you're right. basically getting married to your you know founder yeah. as a VC, yeah. and as a founder, you're getting married to your VC. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing is I created a model and I was like, oh, you know, Oculus is going to take like, like just as you know, trying to be conservative. It was like it would probably take 10 years. I think you're absolutely right, though. The CapEx costs would have been crushing. I mean, it are crushing. I mean, it's just hardware is really, really hard. And so to to be a startup in hardware, your thing would have to take off so hard. You know, and they just that's just not what happened. Yeah. I mean, there, there are definitely examples of that. I guess Nest, for example, you know, interesting example of that, obviously still acquired by yeah, Google, I mean, by Google. Yeah, but, kind uh, of. Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah. True. But so, I mean, if that doesn't happen. Yeah then you, people are not going to throw billions of dollars at you. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's so, why everyone yeah. passed on our, on, on Octos of Series A, right? I mean, like we, we passed yeah. on the Series A, it was $15 million, Spark and Matrix ticket. Um, but, you know, it was like, you know, factories in Shenzhen, China, you, you have high capital expenditures and your marginal cost, you know, to produce is not zero the way that it is with software or virtually zero, right? Right, exactly. So, yeah, it's- Exactly. So, um, I mean, they, so, so- uh, my my point simply is yeah. Mark Zuckerberg decided this was going to happen. Yeah, totally. He, and he decided that it didn't matter really that much how much it cost yeah. because of the scale of the opportunity. Yeah. Of, co of course, ironically, he's lost control of the metaverse conversation. That's, you know, what do you think of that? I care. I'd love to get your perspective on how, who, like what's, what's happened and who has control of the metaverse. Is it back to the people now or? No, it's a conversation. The metaverse is just a conversation about the future of the internet, but let me post postulate a situation, which could easily happen today. You are in VR inside of rec room. You are in quote unquote metaverse as envisioned by uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And um, let's say I'm on a game console and you are playing on a smartphone. The three of us could still occupy a virtual space together. Am I not in the metaverse? Are you not in the metaverse? So, so uh, again, I mean, I, uh, and also remember the metaverse includes the digital twin of the physical world. So, um, you know, I would argue you are on your, uh, smartphone just as much in the metaverse as the guy in the VR headset. The difference between the guy in the VR headset and you on your smartphone is that you are having a mediated 2D experience, whereas the person inside of VR has presence and a first person, you know, actual experience versus a media experience. That's all. Um, so those are very different experiences of the same thing of the same conversation. But the place that we occupy together through those devices is unquestionably the metaverse. So the metaverse cannot be VR exclusively. 
Um, and, you know, it may not be VR really may be sort of nice to have, you know, sort of be a good way to experience the metaverse, but it can't be the only way. And so, uh, you know, when Zuckerberg made that big movie to, I forget what it's called, uh, when they changed the name from Facebook to Meta, you know, that part was kind of left out. And, you know, the kind of vision of people in VR being inside of the physical world was, you know, very, very science fiction-y, but not wrong directionally. Right. So what's going to happen, right? We're going to start seeing 3D objects on Amazon instead of chiclets, you know, with different photo views, you know, you spin it around and make it close and make it far away. You know, I think that'll be the beginning of the metaverse sort of invading the internet. I don't think it's possible for the metaverse to, um, to sort of change the internet as much as sort of get integrated in it. Oh, I want to experience this in 3D. But the, the use case for it is not really there yet, right? Because most things you do on the internet, you want them to be 2D. And by the way, you want them to be web 2.0 because you know why? Google is really freaking useful and it's free. It's $2.99 a month for the storage. I use Google Docs. I use Google Drive. It's epic. I use the email. I use the calendar. It is epically great. I'm not giving it up. I remember Web 1.0 when all, we had all these separate programs and devices, and I'm not going back. So when I hear about Web 3 projects, there are many things that Web 3 can do that are really useful. You know, the tokenization of certain marketplaces is a no brainer. Um, but uh, for many things, it makes no sense at all. So, uh, you know, and and so, uh, you know, in a way, VR is kind of similar. You know, for many things, VR is the only way to do it. But for many things, it makes no sense for it to be VR. So, and again, the interest of the public in VR is not great. Um, and uh, that is uh, unexpected. To, for me, uh, I mean, I, I would think the quest would be more popular, but what I'm seeing with my students is that, as I said, it is damned with faint praise. I love VR. This is awesome. How much VR did you do over the summer? Well, not that much because I, you know, was busy with other screens. So, you know, damned with faint praise, as I said, you know, it's not like a smartphone where you say, oh, I can't live without this. You know, I think that it it has uh, Im the importance of a game console. Like I said, niche game console. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about what changes that. I mean, there's plenty of people doing it to maintain a software ecosystem. And it's not like they're selling zero of them. But I'm not sure they're getting more people to buy a headset than more headsets are going into drawers, right? Mm. One thing we don't know is the utilization of the headset sold. Yeah. I, I think one thing that's heartening, though, to see, I mean, the, the numbers, I, I agree, and totally, you know, somebody who's been in VR for, you know, quite a while, I, I agree with you on all this. Um, I think the punchline, I think the good news is the big companies, Meta, and Possibly Apple and others will will be the ones spending lots of money and effort to to, to get this continually in people's hands. But um, but I think um, the interesting thing is I find that when you look at the Steam numbers, right, the concurrent users for you know the Rec Rooms and the VR chat, especially VR chats of the world. I mean, Rec Room has a much wider base across PS4 and et cetera. But a lot of VR chat users who are hardcore can only use it on PC VR through Steam, right. so that they can get full body tracking and right. you know all of that stuff. Um, you know, those numbers are not going down. They're, they're staying steady, if not going up in a really steady way. Right. And, you know, at the very least you have sustained engagement. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are people who are in VR who are using it. I just don't know, um, uh, how many there are, or if that is enough. Right. And I'm just wondering why it's not growing more quickly. Um, you know, because it, it has not followed the development pattern of uh, i mean it's following the development pattern of the pc and it's like 1992 and a lot of people still don't see why they would have a pc in their home right the pc has not yet met the internet 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's actually a great analogy because it's, it's doing better than like the mainframe or the mini computer, <laughs> but it's not doing really better than the PC. Actually, the PC might be the best analogy. It's just this big expensive thing. That's thousands of dollars. That's really inconvenient to use. Um, you know, but it does allow you to do things that you can't do anywhere else. <laughs> I mean, I, again, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but again, you know, I think the, there's, you know, a lot of the conversation has shifted to back toward 3D virtual worlds that we're accessing through our 2D screens. Uh, and, and you know, that's an argument that's made by Matthew Ball, who is a acolyte of uh, Tim Sweeney and, you know, who runs Epic Games and, you know, and, and and has Fortnite, which is, you know, still quite young. It's only from 2017 yet. I mean, in a way, he is you know, uh, controls the largest metaverse. Yeah. Uh, so, or, or, I mean, I'm calling virtual worlds a metaverse for, uh, I mean, metaverse is really uh, whatever you want it to be. It's a made up word from science fiction, but it's a good way of talking about where are we going with all of this? Um, I, I think the other really thing, interesting thing um, is it's sort of a way, it's like a movement back towards synchronicity. Mm, yes. Right. Because we've been enjoying an asynchronous life for the past 25 years, right? Uh, starting with answering machines, we no longer had to be physically present with one another. And, um, you know, and then the smartphone was introduced and it you know, put that on steroids. Right. So to the point that we don't really make phone calls anymore, or if we do, they're arranged oftentimes by text. <laughs> like like this <laughs> yeah exactly like this conversation. Because, you know because you know <laughs> because 30 years ago it would have been oh well i'll come over to the office yeah right that would have been the only way to do it and of course because of that we both would have a high incentive to be proximate to one another in a city like san francisco or new york or la right that was sort of the power of cities would be that we could do that serendipitously as we have done this zoom call yeah. It's really fun to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, great to see you again. Good to uh, see you. I would love to hear more about what you guys are working on. Are you close to releasing anything? As you know, we don't like to spoil surprises, but uh, we got a lot. Wasn't expecting you to. Yeah. That's why I asked when, when am I going to see something? Definitely soon. And I think okay, uh, you related to our, the beginning of our conversation. I think this AI stuff has given us a lot of ideas of how to, you know, modify. I wouldn't say it's going to revolutionize just yet. That might be too strong. No, you'll, 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 it'll help you do things for sure. Give you ideas and um, help you, as you said, rehearse scenes and, and ideas. And I think it's great. Yeah. Do things faster, faster, cheaper, and ultimately better. I, I can't, I can't wait to see all the use cases that are going to emerge. We plan to be at the forefront of figuring out some of those things, but certainly the world is a big place. So I'm sure we'll be surprised again and again by the developments of, of AI and how that's going to change everything. But again, you know, clearly you've illustrated its applicability to media businesses in a very dramatic way. So yeah. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. I, I can't wait to see what you turn up with this. Thanks for your time today. Cheers.